Yes, um, Imran Madden, head of the humanitarian department at Islamic Relief. Um, firstly, Islamic Relief would like to thank um, Alnap Help Age and Handicap International for this very informative and uh, timely report. Um, if I could just mention a couple of things before I get to my question, because mm. there's a bit of context. No, please, so, go so ahead. Forgive me. Um, as an NGO, uh, Islamic Relief has a number of programs in the region for both Syrian refugees and those within Syria. Um, while we, we do our utmost to, to address the needs of the most vulnerable, uh, you know, very much in the context of your report, um, we recognize that we, we can be doing more uh, and, and be you know, uh, extending our reach. Um, looking at your recommendations, which, which directly address NGOs like Islamic Relief, um, uh, you know, where you mention um, that uh, we need to sensitize and build the capacities of staff to identify and include people with specific needs uh, in response uh, activities. Uh, and this includes um, you know, to integrate a focus on refugees with specific needs into staff inductions and training. Um, so, so my question is, um, if I can ask, what, 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 are, what kind of concrete, concrete steps um, can we expect to ensure that NGOs like Islamic Relief uh, can sensitize and build capacities of its staff both in the UK and in the region and, and specifically, especially within Syria, which is a, a very, very big challenge given that, you know, they're the most vulnerable mm. groups. Mm. So what, what kind of concrete steps might we expect? Because obviously the recommendations are excellent mm. and they, they, they're very good at focusing mm. what happens next, but it's really important that they're followed mm. up with really concrete steps to ensure that we can build on the report. Mm. Imran, thank you very much. Who, who, who else has a comment? Please raise your hands. Sir, please, in, in the... Oh, beg your pardon. You're, you beat me to it. We'll, we'll go here first, and then we'll come to the gentleman in front. <coughs> Thank you. Hi, um, my name's Samara. I'm also from Islamic Relief, but from the Programs Department. Mm. Um, I had um, a question or a comment reg regarding... So going back to the issue of registration, you, um, from an academic perspective, you said, um, yes, people don't necessarily want to be labelled as being a refugee. Do you think also, even if there was the option now during registration to... Um, in c to have disability and registered an impairment and mental health, do you think it's a that people are, they would even be hesitant to have that label put on them as well? Thank you very much. Go to the gentleman at the front here, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, Jostan Amir. I'm uh, Vice President of MSF Holland. Um, I wanted to ask or challenge, well, actually not challenge, but the, the notion that the... the um, maybe the elderly and the disabled made it to the refugee settings um, because of their impairment. Um, maybe you could also argue the other way around, that because they have an impairment, they would stay in Syria. So are there any data about similar issues that you researched in Jordan and in Lebanon from inside Syria? And, and what do they reflect? Is it in those terms you could also expect it might be worse than you actually find in the camps because of people because of their injuries and their chronic diseases, um, not enabling them, them to travel and to go somewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take another couple. Please. Thank you. Um, I'm Lee Danes from Medicine du Monde, Doctors of the World. Thank you for your presentations and for this excellent piece of work. It's really helpful. Uh, Arushi, if I may, I'd like to ask you, um, we ag agree with the analysis that this will now be a chronic long-term problem. There'll be lots and lots of people who are trapped indefinitely, sadly, with little hope for the future. Can, can I ask what discussions have you had with the government of Jordan about their prognosis? <coughs> how, how together can we manage what will probably be an indefinite uh, humanitarian come development problem for those large communities of people who are trapped uh, in Jordan where you work? Thank you. Lee, thank you very much. We'll, we'll go to the panel now. So there's one particular question for you, Arushi, but a anyone would like to start? I'll fire away mm. for, for the answers that I can mm. provide. Mm. Uh, um, to your question, Imran, about what are the next steps, what, what do these, these uh, recommendations <coughs> for improved identification actually mean? Uh, I can speak for the region, what we are, what we are working on and, and what we think are the best ways to move forward based on, on what we found. Uh, capacity building of staff, yes, so that means training, that means what we will do as Help Age and Handicap is that we will support this capacity building effort, but also training of trainers. So we want to enable others 
to pass on this this uh, expertise and, and, and insights to make sure that it's an inclusive approach that we're working on uh, and identifying specific needs to inform programming. Now, that's the capacity of staff on the one hand. On the other hand, that's not going to last or be sustainable if the system itself doesn't see adaptations. So we want to also look at, and we have been looking for the past few years, at methodologies, at, at matrices, at, at the instruments that agencies use to make sure that their staff uh, can give a place to the identified needs in, in, the, in their assessments, in their, in their screenings, in everything that comes through their, uh, through their system. So it is both the staff as well as the, the design of, of, of tools and instruments of agencies that we want to support the quality of. Um, as I said, in this, this is something that we see as a joint effort. So it's, it's something that we can support as expert agencies, but we also want to ensure that this is, that disability related issues or aging related issues are not something that should stay with expert agencies. It's very much, the whole point is very much that this is mainstream because mm -hmm. you have a family come from Syria into a refugee context, for example. This is one family and should be approached as such. It's not, we have a, f a few adults and there's also an older person. This is one family with uh, household needs and, and then specific needs for some. Uh, and this is how we should look. We should have a holistic approach where, where, where age specific and disability specific needs are, are integrated into <coughs> overall health response, overall shelter responses, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, some uh, a practical announcement, I think, uh, what would be uh, uh, good to make. On the 14th of May, we are having a, a sharing and learning event in Amman, in which we invite all uh, regional uh, actors to, to participate. Uh, this is aimed at enhancing our understanding of, of disability and aging inclusion. So we want to bring together lessons learned where, where other actors have made a really strong effort to, uh, to, to improve inclusion. We want to make sure that we we provide the exchange that we think can, 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 in order not to reinvent the wheel, that we build upon the experience that we've had so far, uh, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and also identify where do agencies see that they need the, the biggest uh, technical uh, and practical support. So also that we are very targeted in where we uh, invest on capacity building. So that's a very long answer to, <laughs> to your mm. question. Uh, then about the registration uh, and the implications that improved identification of disability and other specific needs might have on willingness to register, if I understood your question correctly. Mm. Uh, what we identified in the survey is that one of the reason reasons for not registering is fear, indeed. I mean, and very clearly, mm. looking at the context that people have come from, knowing the Syrian context, uh, this fear for registration is, is very much present across the different groups. But for, for people with specific needs and people in general, we, we see that one of the other reasons for not registering is that they don't have, uh, uh, they don't see the, the added value of registering. They don't see that it will lead to uh, assistance or access to increased access to basic services. So where disability identification, for example, uh, is going to be uh, followed up by implications for access to services, that factor will be that factor will be uh, then overturned. So this has this implies for many levels. So it's the the information that people have about access to services, and the actual increased access to services for people with specific needs. Uh, these two come together, I would say. Uh, about injury and chronic disease inside Syria. Uh, what we are seeing is that this compared to Syria, there's a <coughs> higher proportion of people with injuries in the host countries, in neighboring countries. So we are seeing that they are more likely to flee the country. But what data is also showing, as, as you're probably well aware, is the, the complete uh, destruction and, and breakdown of the, of the health system inside Syria. People are not able to access, uh, I mean, even people with severe injuries, women giving birth, uh, it's, it's in, all, in all facets of, of the health sector that people are not able to access. Uh, I think it was 89% that Handicap International found, 89% of the people they came across with new injuries that were not having uh, adequate or no access at all to, to healthcare rehabilitation, rehabilitation services. Um, for chronic disease, this is the same. Uh, there was a capacity inside Syria for the production of chronic disease medication. Uh, I think 90% was produced inside Syria. That has dropped by 70%. 
So this is something that affects all of Syria, not only the besieged areas where, where people are not able to leave, uh, not only those areas that are uh, disproportionately affected by the hostilities. This is across the board. People do not have access to chronic disease medication. So the interruption of chronic disease care st starts in Syria. And I, I think what we are seeing on the ground very often is one of the one of the pushes to make people decide to leave. They um, one of the findings in the report, which uh, <coughs> I think it would be interesting to research more, is that we see the households of persons that include a person with specific needs are significantly smaller than uh, than the households that do not have a person with specific needs. So this would this would imply, given the the, the analysis we we gave to that data, that people with specific needs are more likely to be uh, taken out or traveling out out of Syria with one accompanying person or a caregiver or a few relatives um, <coughs> rather than the whole family moving as a whole. I think those are the, the questions that I could answer. Let me just, uh, uh, you've been so thorough that I'm just going to make a, <laughs> uh, an addendum. I, I had a chance to spend some time in Merj in Lebanon in the Western Bekaa, uh, which is um, a place of many of the stateless Bedouin who are providing a lot of care to some of the host communities. And I, I talked with a number of families who had uh, wounded members with them. And it's exactly what you said, because I then asked, where's, where's who else is in the family? Um, and it's it's this is the case. Generally, it's um, a, a caregiver and perhaps one or two very young children, um, if it's a, a wife or a daughter. So the families are being split. Whether they will then later on regroup uh, as the as the fighting continues it will depend really on uh, any further flare up um, uh, within Syria itself. Yeah, just uh, one addition to Lydia. Um, also, like we recently concluded the uh, AGDM, Age Gender Diversity Participatory Assessment that uh, looks at the specific needs of, of, of individuals, but also look at the capacities of the communities. And one thing came quite, uh, quite clear in the urban non-camp settings, we saw the uh, capacity of the family. And I think in the end, and you are quite correct, um, Syrians generally, or, or I would say Jordanians also, they like to support this kind of, uh, I mean, if there is a person with disability, if there's a person with special <coughs> needs, they really, li they support. And we did not come across a large number of uh, unaccompanied elderly or mm -hmm. unaccompanied, like, you know, or children with disability that are not. So the family-based response is something that I think we have to really look at it. If we look at programs, we would have to look at ways to design it in a way to use the, the traditional practice to support this, uh, because we don't want to limit it the identification at registration level. I mean, there was a, a question on this, but I think it's not always that they fear to register, but we would really want to um, discourage that. We would re really want to encourage, and there are confidentiality. I mean, that is, uh, we don't want to label them that they are disabled. That, that there are features in registration where it is clearly for response also. It's one is identification. It helps us improve the our protection response as well. So it's extremely critical that we encourage and there are fears that are extremely legitimate. It's very mm. much, uh, I mean, we don't deny that, but what we're trying to do is we are also trying to scale up the registration facility as well. As compared to 2012, at least I can say <coughs> for Jordan and Lebanon, I mean, Jordan, we have, uh, now we have three facility centers, I mean, where we have ex expanded the capacity, but also we do something through our community <coughs> outreach uh, mechanism, mobile registration. So we do know that, and this, this is not done uh, like uh, like the registration, we, we do it more within a response as well, like where we look at, we take the services to the people, because we do know that there are often many communities, not, this, not just uh, people with disabilities, but many communities often have, they lack information, they also have, uh, there are dynamics within the communities that, d that does not allow them to come to UNHCR. So mobile registration through that also we would, mm -hmm. so we would like to look at other tools of identification, and that's something I think, I mean, I, I kind of could not mention, but I think uh, we would like to share all of these. But uh, that's something that we would like to look at. Registration is one way to identify, but there's so many other tools that we need to find out. If our objective is to enhance identification and strengthen as well the quality of identification, we need to, we need to look at uh, various other opportunities much more creatively. Otherwise, it will be very traditional, the same way of, you know, looking at within that closed box, okay, this is, you know, it's, it's like a tick in the box, I would say. We would really look at more comprehensively. So 
I would look at uh, exploring the other means of uh, you know, registration, I mean, identifying the vulnerable population. And there was one question again, I think. Um, only, I guess only really on, on Imran's point around <laughs> capacity. I mean, I think the, the, the new program I talked about is a good opportunity mm -hmm. to, to, to help <coughs> think that through. But I think the other thing is about lesson <coughs> learning. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we have a unit in my team which looks at lesson learning across DFID and, and uh, the sort of programs that, that we fund. We can certainly do a better job in terms of looking at what worked, what didn't work on this particular issue. But I'd encourage y you, know, you also to share that sort of information, and then we may be able to you know, share that globally and with other donors. Good, thank you. Um, more points? Questions? Sir, please. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Alan. I work for CAFOD, uh, Caritas England and Wales. And I guess this is a question for each sort of individual panel member is how we work with national partners. The risk is that we rush in, we duplicate and replace what already exists and how we can complement and add to what national partners are already doing. There are a number of large scale national partners working across the region doing far outreach projects. So how do we work with them and not try and replace them all the time? Alan, thank you very much. Anyone else? I can feel someone bursting behind <laughs> me to answer this <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is something that I think, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry I could not respond to uh, the previous question on discussions with governor, government on the long term. Like, I think this is something being discussed. Uh, they, they are looking, I think the humanitarian aid actors, even the government, at least in Jordan, the national resilience plan is being developed. And I think at some point there has to be this link of humanitarian response and development. We have to have that connect connection. And I think, I mean, that's something that is already started. That is, there is already, um, I mean, we, we were, we had completed the regional response plan six, RRP six, where actually programmatically we were looking at only the emergency. But I think we have to look at now stabilization, I think. And that will bring in this development, uh, these uh, national actors. I would see a huge opportunity here because in jo I can uh, speak for Jordan at least, and we have our implementing partners, our national partners, because that was the, they have expertise, they have uh, the local traditional knowledge, how to respond to these people, but also they have, mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, long-term, I mean, th they have uh, programs, which was even for Iraqi crisis, they had excellent programs. We would like to, in I mean, we would see more and more engagement with national actors, but also like they need technical, guidance or technical support, I think that we should really uh, look at it together. But we, th there is a, how do you say, if you invest more on them, th it could be much better. Because uh, if the crisis prolongs, and of course people will be in the non-CAM settings, which is, they're actually being uh, s supported, uh, we like it or not, even through programs or not, they are being supported by the family, by the community. There is a willingness to support, that's there. But how do we invest on these other, um, small actors, but they have, uh, they have the will, uh, they have the willingness, attitude, but also also the modesty to support these uh, people. Sometimes, because one is our own response, which is sometimes often uh, resource, not need based. Then that stops at a point. But then, how do they integrate within the community? So there is a community based response that should be that national actors can play a better role than you know small uh, you know or uh, like earmarked funding activities. And that's something that, jo I mean, for UNHCR Jordan, I think we are trying to really, really invest a lot on this. Indeed. Thank you. Sorry. Anyone want to um, comment on the how to work with national partners? Question point? I'm just, uh, obviously, as an anthropologist, I'm going back to the local. <laughs> I think there isn't a one model fits all. I think what will work in Jordan will not work in Lebanon. Uh, you, we do have to keep in mind that there are no refugee camps in Lebanon. There are some uh, reception facilities uh, in the north, but you're talking about something over a hundred or a thousand settlements um, with local hosting, local NGOs, some of them getting support you know, from uh, agencies like Open Society, etc. So the model that would be developed for Lebanon is going to be very, very different from the model in Jordan. Mm -hmm. And I think you do need to keep that in mind. I'll leave that for now. Yeah, uh, yeah not much to add to that, but I think uh, mainly what 
and just to to bring it back to this report, what we are really seeing where the biggest uh, need for the capacity building in the host countries exists at the moment is within the health system. So the chronic disease implications long term, uh, not only the capacity building, but also providing the resources because uh, the people might be there to be trained, but then in the long term, how is how is the the economy of the of the situation capable of of accommodating that? Uh, and the same for the rehabil long term rehabilitation care. We are already seeing um, in the national system and in the humanitarian response that some of the post operatory care mm -hmm. is simply not falling into any of the category mm -hmm. or boxes of uh, mm -hmm. of the response and on the host country. So. Um, for complex fractures, which is very common after uh, incident of bombing, uh, where, for example, people have external fixators uh, and are then sent home. And then there's no accommodation within that system for the external fixator to be removed. I mean, those mm. kind of gaps, they're very specific, but they have they can have very, very far-stretching consequences. So what, as you'll see uh, in, in this report, like we are trying to be really precise about where we see for these particular groups, the long-term projections and the need for capacity and resource uh, uh, provision in the host in the host countries good let's try and do one last round of uh, questions comments points from the floor please who'd like to kick off Raymond you look as though you're just about to put your hand up <laughs> well there you go I'm, I'm finally attuned <laughs> Raymond, uh, please, please tell us who you are. Oh, uh, Raymond uh, mm. Apthorpe. I'm also an anthropologist of, <laughs> of sorts. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm actually just come back from a month in, uh, in, in Jordan, and I'm just going back for a second month at the weekend. So I mean, I mean, the main thing is really to welcome and to admire the, the study. I think that's the main thing that I should do. Um, uh, with perhaps just one or two comments, um, the quantitative it is a quantitative study, but if one looks at the other quantitative, uh, whatever, however quantitative they are, they're rather qualitative quantitative accounts, I think your figures are even understating the problem. I think there's enough support from other figures to argue that the problem is bigger, that the invisibility is, is much more. Much more, let me just say more, I mean, I'm not really I can't calibrate. Mm. That's one thing. Um, secondly, it, it's always good you know, to look ahead and think of what one should do next. But why didn't one do it before? There's a historical question here. Why was the elderly, the impaired, and then why were they not provided for before? Why were they invisible? I mean, that it can't just be taken for granted. There must be reasons for that. And as an anthropologist, I mean, another anthropologist in the room, mm. we can think of reasons for that, um, uh, which um, perhaps just this kind of assumption that women and children are, are the most affected. Well, are they? That could be a rather ethnocentric assumption. I believe it is. And I've seen this you know, in other cases. But I think we should ask w whether training is just the answer. There's much more to, to it than just training. And whether another kind of officiousness, a better kind of officiousness, is better than the old kind of officiousness. If, if officiousness is the problem, then I think one eventually has to look really much further from that. I mean, has to look more broadly. As, 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 to, as to how the international and the national can work better together, one really has to be careful with that. I mean, what I saw uh, in the last month, um, can I just give one just a little example? An actual Please go ahead. You know, I was interviewing, mm. and I was with a nutritionist, an international nutritionist, and with a local nutritionist from Save the Children, Jordan Save the Children. And it, 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 it gradually became cl clear that there was a big disagreement between the two people on exactly what uh, it was a food preparation, exactly what it was, and how it should be prepared. and and in what measures should, should be given. There was such a disagreement, and I thought, well, disagreements happen and the issues are different. I'm not a nutritionist, perhaps I haven't quite uh, you know, learned enough. And then later on, <laughs> I discovered, in fact, 
the nutritionist, the international nutritionist in question, told me, well, I'm not a nutritionist. My specialization is TB. Is what? TB, tuberculosis. TB, I you said TB. Very famous, oh, sorry. I believe. <laughs> very famous, very specialized. So, I mean, partly the, the problems of the international working with the national in specific areas is that the international are, are simply the wrong people. In that technical sense, apart from social senses, apart from yeah. language senses and so on. Sorry, John, these are just a few yeah. random comments, but it, it really must welcome the report and admire the various discussions that we've had. Raymond, thank you very thank much. You. I'm going to turn to our online questions now. Um, there's a gentleman, talking of nutritionists, from the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine called Adam, who, who has given us lots of questions. Um, I'm just going to take one of Adam's questions. And he says, don't the panel think that the privatised healthcare system is the biggest barrier to an effective health response in Lebanon? Uh, he says that 82% of the hospital beds in Lebanon are private. Um, we have uh, Sandrine Tiller from MSF UK. And San Sandrine thanks you all for a very interesting discussion. She's looking forward to the report, and her question is, is there a difference between the conditions of living and access between camp settings and non-camp settings? And I'll do one more. Uh, this is from Sarah House, and she's an independent uh, consultant, a WASH consultant. Please could it be elaborated what support is currently provided for PWD and older people for their rent, uh, the costs of chronic related health care and support for managing incontinence, for example. So I have some questions for, from, from Raymond uh, and, and three questions from online. Can I just resp ask, respond? Go ahead, you're the anthropologist. Uh, uh, no well, <laughs> I'll say a little bit about Lebanon because I've just actually finished doing a, a study of um, the Bedouin access to health care of the Bedouin in Lebanon many of whom are stateless because they refused to take part in the French national census in 1936. So they don't have access to government health care. You're right, there isn't really much government health care. I think government health care in Lebanon uh, provides a, some sort of subsidized access to certain hospitals. But basically, Lebanon is, a, is an amazing state. It's a state that can function without government for very long periods of time, um, which basically means that uh, uh, um, health care even really uh, quality education, um, welfare, etc., is all private or within the hands of the family. Um, so th that's one of the reasons why I said you have to think carefully how you deal with the Lebanese case as compared with the Jordanian case. And again, I say, and we could look at Turkey for some very, very, very good um, responses. Uh, so th th the yes, that is a problem, and I think that's why we really have to find a way of working with the numerous local. NGOs that are up and running in Lebanon but often need more support. So, and I don't think that's as difficult to find because there is a registration uh, process within the Lebanese government for these um, various very small scale local NGOs to operate. And many of them are, for example, helping 15 or 20 families of uh, 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 refugees from Syria and so on. Uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan is very different. They have a very sophisticated healthcare system. So sophisticated, in fact, which, I, I, which takes me to a different kind of uh, uh, comment. There is a kind of refugee medical care tourism that does set in place when you get into a protracted mm -hmm. refugee mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. We all know, and I think UNHCR was tearing its hair out towards the end in Syria, that many Iraqis uh, uh, began coming to Syria, registering <coughs> as uh, refugees in order to access really specialist health care. And uh, I think uh, UNHCR's budget was, was uh, seriously strained. That is what will happen as the situation becomes protracted. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't, we don't have ways of dealing. We don't really have many lessons learned. The only other um, refugee situation I can think of that was with a middle income country or a Western country is Bosnia. And that really didn't move into the what's happening now, which is the more protracted stage. Mm -hmm. So we really have to be, I think, quite creative. Um, Camp setting, non-camp setting, I, I'm a little bit worried about responding to that because <laughs> I don't want UNHCR to be uh, uh, offended by any of my comments. But no, please, <laughs> but I can add on to She's it. Okay. Yeah, You're smiling. <laughs> no, no, um, no, I will, I can, I can <laughs> Okay, can most, most of the refugees from Syria did not want to be in camps. Mm. Uh, and many of those yeah, in Zatari camp, um, different regimes have taken place. They're there, many of them, 
try to find ways of, of getting out from, uh, you know, there was one point there were about 180,000 and now it's down to about 100,000 to find ways of leaving, uh, sometimes by paying a smuggler to get them out because it's very difficult to leave officially. And those of you who, who were watching some of the reports in the last few days, some of the riots, uh, we don't know what started them, but I suspect it, as some of the reports suggested, somebody was trying to leave and they weren't being allowed to. So I'll leave you to make more comments on that. No, it's amazing to see how you're really updated on the very latest thing that is happening in Sathuri or uh, Jordan. That's quite, I mean, it's amazing. No, I, I actually, it's true. Last week, there was this incident. Um, on the services in the camp and non-camp, it's uh, it's not that we, UNHCR decides who will stay in the camp. It's the gov government of Jordan. And there are legal crossing and legal border crossing and the illegal border crossing. So it's it's decided very much by the authorities. But on this on the on the services, uh, the challenges is in the non-camp settings. Definitely, they don't have access to a lot of services. They have access to services, but it's not adequate. Eighty percent of the refugee population registered with UNHCR are in the non-camp, which is the urban host communities, and twenty percent is in the camp. And we would be, o and I, I'm sure m many of you will be aware. The third camp is about to be open in 30th of April, which is Azra camp. So there would be a third camp which is going to be mm. opening up. And that will uh, also, I don't know, I mean, there it would create much more challenges. Um, on, this on the services, it's, uh, it's different. But also because uh, in, in the camp, now we're trying to harmonize through the interagency process we tr and, and the RRP6 process. We're trying to harmonize the assistance. In Auburn, there is a cash-based assistance program for the non uh, for the non-camp population, for, but in the camp, there are not they are not provided cash-based assistance because and a World Food Program provides a e-voucher now. They have they have moved uh, to a new program which is e-vouchers where they can access they can have the freedom to uh, choose things that they want to buy in the AT through the ATM card, and they have tied up with uh, supermarkets. So they I it's not adequate. It's it's going to be. It, it, it is going to get reduced. So we have to be much more targeted, uh, considering that the cash-based program that is in Lebanon and Jordan does not, I mean, we try our best to address or accommodate as many as possible and most vulnerable, and we do a targeted programming. And uh, I think recently there was a small study that we have ca ca carried out. I would be happy to share a link. And this book was released very recently. I don't know if anybody had a chance to have a look at it. But it's quite uh, the, the analysis and some of the things that has come out has been is very very interesting and could uh, respond to some of the questions that came up here so I, I just carried one copy but it is already in the uh, Syrian uh, refugee response portal it's, uh, it's already a public document but this is a home based home visit that we carry out for each individual refugees registered with UNHCR it is not an outreach uh, but it's very much linked to assistance because this is something that we wanted to look at it's an opportunity for us to once they register, that's not where our relationship with the refugee stops. I think it's, it is not possible. We have to continue the engage. We have to continue seeing the situation, assessing the, the, their, their conditions. So we have made it a mandatory within a programmatic response to do a home visit for each of these individuals. And this is where we look at the specific needs, but their family situation, compounded vulnerabilities. And uh, we have started this, and then this is linked to our response, which is a cash-based intervention. It's one of the biggest program within, within the region of Jordan and Lebanon. And we are trying to look at how do we link the other interventions to this. I if there is a scope, if there is, it has resource implication, it has other dimensions, how do we link this to a broad cash base? Uh, is it addressing the vulnerability? Is it, or is it only linked to uh, like the income, of the household, or, or, or uh, is it looking at vulnerabilities that could be within a family? It could be more than three vulnerabilities. How do we how do we package this? How do we uh, ensure that these are all included? I think this visit that is now it has uh, this report is based on seventy three thousand families that were visited. It's ongoing, but we wanted to look at w on education ch and and there was a lot of children who didn't attend school last year who were who enrolled but never attended. So there are many things that came up, and it is this is what we are looking at it now. And I think it is an opportunity in this report that has come up also to look at age and disability. I mean, how, how have we seen this within the home visit? Because it did not, it was for all refugees registered with UNHCR. So I'll be happy, I mean, I'll be happy to receive reactions, comments. I think it will help us also to see what, how do we link a response to 
to something that we have already identified, but then what is, the re what is next? Wha how do we link them to the other uh, you know, different uh, interventions? Please. You know, it was not very satisfactory on the conditions of services. It is not, it is different, but it's not more or less. <laughs> I, I can't really say that. Yeah, just a few things I'd like to add in addition to what you've said. Uh, uh, and as Raymond was asking the question, why haven't we looked into this before? Why, mm -hmm. why is it now that we have a report uh, for, for these particular groups in emergency setting? I think it comes a step before that mm -hmm. is in a non-crisis, in a non-displacement, in a non-emergency setting, how much do we think about disability? How much do we think mm -hmm. about chronic disease? How much do we think about aging? How much do we understand about it? Uh, and, and for example, in, in the emergency setting, just one example, uh, when we think about livelihood or livelihood mm -hmm. responses, um, we are nothing, when, when we look at these groups, we're not thinking about capacities. We're not thinking about how can they be integrated to ensure that also they have a source of income. Um, there's a few really good examples of how, how it was integrated, but that's not the trend across the board. So where the thinking hasn't started in, in the basic setting, it definitely has to be pushed for more in the emergency setting, I'd say. Um, in terms of the privatized uh, healthcare system that, that Adam uh, addressed, definitely, I mean, I think uh, everyone's very aware of the financial constraints of the health response, uh, both at macro level, organizational response, as well as household level, how do people manage to access and pay for care? Um, what Handicap International uh, assessed last year is that in, in there's a debt crisis, especially in Lebanon among refugees, as it's getting more and more protracted. And 12% of those uh, going into debt stated that their main reason for having ended up in debt was because of their uh, healthcare related costs. So it's really the choice between medicines and bread, the me medicines and a roof over your head. That's the daily choice that refugees there have to make. Then Sandrine was asking about the, the difference mm -hmm. between camp and non-camp setting. Again, what we found in this study is that both mm -hmm. refugees with specific needs and those without specific needs prioritize shelter as our main concern. Mm -hmm. It's a priority that they're struggling to, to, uh, um, to guarantee and that makes also that makes it a very mobile, I think, uh, refugee population. People are facing evictions, or when they're not facing evictions, they're trying to prevent it by moving to uh, cheaper and 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 yeah, uh, worse f uh, style of, of accommodation, a substandard shelter actually. So it's it's challenging for them to find shelter, and then it becomes more challenging for the humanita humanitarian actors to to keep track of where people are and and to identify people for services. Um, provi support provided to persons with disabilities and older people, um, I think, um, can only speak for, for, our, uh, for our organization for handicap and for, um, for help age. What we try to do and what we try to promote as well, um, as, as you said, the, the response is going to uh, be more and more uh, cash uh, focused. And one of the things that we try to do based on what we uh, identified uh, as, as needs is that people people themselves know really well how to prioritize their, their expenditure. So where health costs are the main, uh, the main priority, they have the cash to pay for it. Where, it. where it's shelter, they have the means to pay for it. So through a vulnerability model that we apply based on what we know, uh, we, we try to um, support them with cash so that at least the, the bread or medicine choice doesn't have to be made by them. Can I just add a small comment on this? Mm. Uh, one of the challenges for Jordan is uh, refugees do not have access to livelihood, and we are, we are adv and this is this requires a lot of advocacy. I mean, I'm not. I mean, this is something that programmatically we could look at the target population of uh, elderly and disabled people. That those families should are prioritized for rent. I'm talking. I think there was a question regarding rent uh, to persons with disabilities and mm. older persons. This is something that we prioritize because this is we can cover. I mean, maybe, I mean, that is something that we'll prioritize also. But when it comes to access to livelihood, and I mean, it's, it's, it's extremely difficult for, in Jordan context, they, they're not allowed um, to uh, access to work. And that is an enormous pressure for us also to look at how do we continue this? How do we support these families? And vulnerability, uh, let's say the, the family that was in 2012, we were doing a mapping, how the vulnerability has changed over the year. What when they came in initially, the new arrivals, they had resources, they had family support, they had, you know, the hospitality of the 
host community but now they're getting strained they are getting impatient also the host community is also getting uh, like there's a lot of study that is going on impact of syrian crisis i mean which triggered the national resilience plan to a, to a great extent on on their own national sy uh, system so it'll it'll be a challenge quite a bit but i i would still s keep this space of targeted programming or area based programming where they are integrated within existing services but uh, rent and something is like very direct assistance we have two cash assistance which is urgent cash wi which is emergency cash and then we have to link them to the monthly financial assistance because this is something that first they are not allowed to work and uh, if they are disabled and elderly i think it is all the more challenging so we would also look at community based mm. response and you know it has to be quite I it is a challenge at least for jordan context they are not allowed to work and we would we would like to advocate more and more with the authorities with with the donors as well i mean it, it's 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 quite a complex situation thanks yeah, thank you would anyone like the final word i think we're moving towards a natural close Yes, good. We have someone that wants the final word. Wonderful. <laughs> I don't know about the final word, but I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say a word. So <laughs> Alima from Handicap International. Um, I'm currently the director here in the UK, but I, before that I spent quite a number of years on our humanitarian programs. And actually, just going back to Raymond's question and linking it to Imran's very first question, I think one of the challenges is accountability in the system is... Um, that sense that, and that Lydia mentioned it in her presentation, is that it's the specialist agencies that will deal with it. And I think that something that we've really brought up in the recommendati recommendations of the report is it, it's about all of us. It's, it's a collective effort, um, everything from donors to um, implementers to national um, authorities to local organizations. It's a really a collective effort, and I think we really welcome the... Uh, the quick wins, as Dylan put them, um, that, that DFID is going to be working on very soon. And I think that that will give sort of that, give more of a framework around the accountability of how do we actually make sure these people are included in everybody's response. Because mm -hmm. yes, there are specific things, like when we talk about post-operative care or access to specific medications, but a lot of what's required is, is mainstream mm -hmm. response that everybody can do. It's about mm -hmm. better registration, it's about mm -hmm. more accessible facilities, better communication. Um, so there's really a role for everybody to play, um, and that goes, of course, well beyond the Syrian crisis. But I think that comes back to that question of why hasn't it not happened before? It's that sense of the specialist agencies will deal with it, or we don't know how. Um, so I guess what we're sort of mm. saying is we can help you so that you do know how to do it, mm. and donors mm. can put in place um, accountability mm. mechanisms to, to really enforce that system. Please do. I, um, I was really struck by... Um, your, your comments, I, I think I would take it one step further and say think about the Syrian refugees as well because many of them are capable, they have training, whether they're as nurses or healthcare assistants or whatever, many of them could actually do the work that we are currently assigning to international uh, support staff. Mm -hmm. I noticed this in Jordan uh, very clearly uh, and uh, also in Lebanon, and I think we should be looking at helping the Syrian refugees themselves mm -hmm. become agents for the, their improvement of their circumstances. Good. Panel? Final thoughts? I guess it's mm -hmm. um, just a really, I think the, the report itself highlights a lot of global issues, and I think you know it's something that we need to tackle not only in Syria but much more broadly and I, and I completely agree with Alima's point around you know this is not just for the specialist agencies what how can we how can we get others to, to do the sorts of things but I also really agree with the point on the refugees I mean it's come up in the education sector as well you know how, how can we get refugees themselves using the skills that they had before they were refugees to be able to to, to contribute so but no thank you a great report good well in that case I will uh, th Thank Lydia uh, very much for, 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 for the report and the presentation, and thank our panellists, Dawn, Arishi, and, uh, and, and Dylan also for their contributions. And of course, thank you to all of you for coming. It's been a very rich and interesting discussion, I think. It's yeah. a great report. And so please, uh, can you join me with a round of applause for the panel? Thank you. <laughs>